And it is it is great to be here. Thanks, Matt and the team for inviting me along. When um, I saw Matt again in, in Adelaide, it was really a good chance to catch up because I was just watching. I, I don't know if you knew, I had, a, I had a good view of the room while you were grabbing your morning tea and I was reminded how we are pretty similar across the ditch. All the little things you were having on your plates were very similar to what we'd say. There was something on a stick, some battered thing on a stick that I've never seen before. But other than that, we're culturally pretty similar. And I guess what we're talking about today in, in terms of fruit fly, we've got some very similar um, challenges and very similar ideals as well, because uh, here in South Australia, uh, we are fruit fly free and work really hard to keep fruit fly out in a similar way to I know that, that you do in New Zealand. So just, just let me share my screen and I'll just hope that um, that is working because it was a minute ago. I can see on the screen there that it is. So. Um, I'll just share that slideshow so it looks a bit better and we'll work through this presentation. Really keen to hear some um, questions and have a bit of interaction after this as well. Very quickly, a bit of history. So South Australia is fruit fly free and has been for a long time. Um, we first prohibited fruit fly, Q fly and med, med fly back um, before the turn of the century, 1897. And we had our first outbreak back in 1947. Um, we published this book here, um, 50 years of being fruit fly free, but we're about due to do our 75th anniversary. So it's a long um, thing that's been in our psyche for over 100 years. Um, and most people in South Australia can say fruit fly free quickly three times without tripping, but it, we're still, we're still um, trying to teach people that as well. Things have changed. Um, we, we don't use the same chemicals we did 50 years ago. I think our first outbreak, we end up removing a whole lot of infested fruit and feeding it to the fish um, out in the Spencer Gulf in the ocean. So we don't do things the same as we, we did, but um, it's certainly something we've been doing for a long time. Very quickly, South Australia and Tasmania are the only states in South Australia which are fruit fly free. Um, so those red states that you see in the map there are where we don't have any fruit fly at all. But we do have pest, two pest species in Australia with the green representing the spread of Queensland fruit fly, which I know you've had a focus on in the past, and blue representing Mediterranean fruit fly, which is only present over in Western Australia. Um, and within South Australia, we have a recognised pest-free area in the Riverland, which um, we are under suspension at the moment, and we'll go through that in a second, but normally we would be exporting product to New Zealand and all a whole lot of other states under formal pest-free area arrangements. We've got a lot of things that we put in place to maintain our freedom and work really hard and, and normally um, spend around $5 million a year to keep fruit fly out of South Australia. Um, we are helped by the fact that we have a very dry climate. Um, so you'll see there that South Australia is largely desert. Um, and so from the west and the north in particular, we have a very strong um, natural barrier and that um, is also the case for entry pathways, natural entry pathways from Queensland and New South Wales. We do have um, a bit of a green triangle down in the southeast, which we need to manage. But other than that, we do have that natural um, isolation in our favour. We do do a lot of things on the border, though, to stop fruit fly coming in. We have permanent quarantine stations, three of them on our eastern border, one of them on our western border, where traffic is stopped and checked. Anything that's found on those uh, vehicles, commercial and private vehicles, is, is taken to stop fruit fly coming in, um, in in infested fruit. And so this is our Yamba quarantine station where all vehicles are stopped 24-7 and um, any fruit taken is cut open. We've got a zero tolerance approach to fruit fly at that station at the moment. So we issue expiations of around $400 for anyone who's found carrying even one piece of fruit. Um, but we do have random roadblocks as well. And that's really important because there are other roads into the state, more than three roads into South Australia. But every road in has one of these sign packages and bins. And we have a random roadblock team that um, do set up um, in an unpredictable way on those roads. So people can be picked up at those. And they also have a, a nil tolerance, a zero tolerance approach where, where fines are issued. Um, we have a significant trapping grid. This is a Linfield trap in a, in a stone fruit. Um, free uh, and we have uh, traps for both Queensland fruit fly and med fly. They're responsive to different lures at various locations. We, we pick the most likely entry pathways and you can see those um, in red boxes there. It's really on the focus that we do have to make sure we manage our riverland area because it's a, it's a formal PFA pest free area, but Adelaide represents our um, 
most likely entry pathway because that's where most people go. And when fruit fly travels across significant distance with people. So in metropolitan Adelaide, each one of these little blue dots you can see there is a trapping site. At each one of those trapping sites, we have two traps, um, one for Mediterranean fruit fly, one for Queensland fruit fly. And at 30 of those sites, we also have a ports of entry trapping grid where we look for exotic fruit flies with a different lure, um, methyl eugenol lure. So there's around about three and a half thousand fruit fly traps that we service every week during the warmer months and, and fortnightly during winter. So over 100,000 trap checks every year is a really important part of our protection as well. We've got an app that lets us do that in real time so we can see where people are and, and keep track of our trap results and diagnostics. Really important when we start um, collecting samples, and I'll talk about sterile flies in a minute, which ultimately leads to collecting thousands of samples. Um, so the sample management challenges are uh, significant as well. Community engagement is really important. We um, make sure people travelling into South Australia are aware before they get to us that we are fruit fly free and there's fines involved with bringing fruit in. So each one of these dots represents a place where people um, are reminded that they can't bring fruit in. There are other spots in Western Australia as well before they get to the border. It's our back of Dunny door um, program where if you go to the toilet anywhere on the road on the way into South Australia, you will be reminded that you could be fined if you don't get rid of your fruit. We also do similar things at the airport, domestic travel. Um, we know from experience that much less fruit travels on air freight or air um, and travellers than what it does on the road, but we it's still an important pathway and we have had detector dogs in use in the past. We're not doing that right now, but um, that is an option for us to use as well at Adelaide Airport. We've got a free call number, really important. And look, most of the traffic that comes through our free call number is, is not fruit fly related. We take around 400 calls a year and most of them are other things that you could find in particularly damaged fruit. We have Drosophila, ferment fly, turns up a lot, vinegar fly. Um, we have other things like Carpophilus beetle, which gets into um, rotting fruit, but that's, that's great. We check those out and um, with iPhone um, technology these days, we can do most of it um, by phone, um, but we do visit and collect any fruit that needs further inspection. And some of our outbreaks have been triggered through that through that mechanism. Right, so we'll get to the Riverland. Um, unfortunately, responses can take time. And one of the challenges we're facing in the Riverland right now is we're running a response that's been running in some form or another since December 2020. So these things don't go away quickly. Even a simple response, um, which do exist, um, take at least three months to resolve. Um, and if we find any fruit fly over February, our mechanism for release is based on the life cycle of the pest. And so they, they are able to overwinter as adults. And so we have a very long um, release mechanism if, if we find any detections after February. So we've got those challenges of keeping people enthused and, and, and um, uh, compliant for quite a long time. We're at these uh, properties, every property in our um, area often, at least weekly, most people would see us two to three times a week. So people see us over over 200 times and that we have to deal with fatigue. And people are letting us into their backyard to do work and remove fruit and apply bait and set traps. So this is the Riverland right now, which is a real challenge. So each one of those dark blue solid lines is an outbreak. Now, you can see that even though we do have um, a number of those, they're, they're connected. It's, it's not a simple um, situation. And not all of those outbreaks are active. More than half of them haven't had a detection in the last three months, which is great, but they are still active outbreaks and we're not going to resolve any of them until they're all resolved. So um, we are concentrating our efforts on hotspots. And so in a way this could look worse than what it is, but at the end of the day, we still have a number of outbreaks that we're managing in the Riverland. Um, so we're doing lots of things and we've had to be innovative in, in what we do. The old formula of applying lots of bait and removing lots of fruit is, is great and it's worked for us for many decades. But we're trying now new, what we're calling attract and kill devices. They're not traps. We can't go through them and pick out flies. Um, but there's things called sera traps, bio traps, and also you might know about male annihilation devices. They're a way of getting thousands of control points out there that stay out there 24 seven all the time. Picking up fruit and checking it's always gonna be important. I'd like to talk about sterile flies in a minute. We release, um, well, we're about to start releasing 40 million sterile flies every week through the Riverland, a really important part of our strategy. 
And that red line you see there is our rolling carpet approach that we applied last year to the sterile fly release program. Um, so more than half a billion flies released now as part of this program. We're doing more trapping and surveillance. We've got, we would normally have 450 traps in the, in the Riverland. We've got over 3,000 now, and that, that goes towards detections, which is great. It's what we want to find. And a really significant market access program because in the Riverland, um, we're dealing with growers. Um, Metro responses, it's all about residents, but this is a grower response and there's hundreds of growers who are managing their businesses and still having to treat fruit and, and manage all the challenges that come with growing fruit um, within a fruit fly outbreak, which is, which is difficult. Um, some other innovative things we've tried, um, we've tried a voluntary tree removal program as a pilot where we go in and remove trees that people aren't able to manage. We're still assessing the benefits of that um, and, and what it does towards fruit fly management, but it's a really important community engagement tool we've found as well and a way of helping people who are doing things for us. Um, you'll see on the right there, one of our detected dogs that we've used in the past, that's Maxi. Um, we know that, that dogs can find fruit fly larvae and fruit. It's still a proof of concept thing for us um, about how we'd use them across broad acres, but much more sensitive, as you'd imagine, at finding larvae inside fruit than what we are, because we rely on seeing what looks like a sting mark, cutting the fruit open and, and, and looking for it. So that, that could be a real game changer um, if we can get that applied at a broad acre level. Uh, we've got obviously a lot of public information going on. We get over, well, you can see there, 29,000 hits on our website in the month of June, which is a quieter month. Our hotline and, and, and media is, is always going. You'll see on the left-hand side of the screen here, our current program of don't let fruit fly under the radar, which is our, um, we try to refresh our messaging on that every, every year or so. So um, I won't go for much further, but just to clean up some of the things we're doing right now, again, one of the challenges is about communication and getting spatial and temporally consistent access to properties. So to us, it's all about communication. Um, regulation is plays its role, but it's it's it, it's not as effective in a long-term program like we're managing. Um, we try to use the stick when we have to, but the carrot, um, particularly over a two-year program, is is really um, what we're trying to apply. Um, we have orders out every day. We'd have um, ten or a dozen orders out at any one time that require people to do work. But at, at the end of the day, a lot of it's about changing hearts and minds, getting people on board, and our research has shown that the Riverland, being a fruit growing region, are really aware of what we're doing and, 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 and supportive. Uh, keys to success are to link um, some of the messaging campaigns to what, what triggers people's responses. So we've got an $100,000 annual communications program, which has to be varied. Things, things, different things work for different people. Um, some people love Facebook, some people uh, read the paper, some people listen to the radio. We just have to be out there and do as much as we can um, in as many different varied formats as we can, as often as we can. Challenges are residential fatigue. We need to refresh that messaging to make it relevant. Our current focus is getting some local faces in, in there. We, 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 we've had that campaign where government people, including myself, have been asking people to um, comply and do the right thing. And, and that's been pretty successful and particularly during COVID times, because again, we've managed this right through the COVID response. Um, people are used to seeing some of that government messaging come out, but right now we're focusing on that local um, champion type approach to getting, um, uh, trying to improve or, or maximise our involvement. Finding that mix of regulation and facilitation is important. We've got an increasing rate of households without English as a first language, so having to translate a lot of their material into other languages uh, is, is important. And um, not so much in the Riverland, but particularly in, in metropolitan Adelaide, that disconnect between um, metro and rural living, where a lot of people don't even know where their food's coming from, where their fruit's coming from, and why it's important to um, support local growers. So that's that's been an important part of our program as well. And that mix of sort of regulating the movement of fruit and still encouraging people to eat the fruit because we want them to value it. And so that's why we, we have industry sitting in on our meetings for communications as well, because we've got to get that, that balance right. And just to finish up, I, I did say we'd talk about DIT, sterile insect technology. So South Australia has a um, facility at Port Augusta where we grow out and irradiate sterile Queensland fruit fly. 
Um, up until now, we have been doing around about 20 million of those a week. We're just increasing our production, so we should soon be at 40 million a week. Really important tool, um, particularly when you've applied other tools and, and knocked the population down to a, a really low level, where these flies can come in and swamp the population if there's any wild flies left. And the, the aim is to limit or remove that opportunity for any of those wild flies to find each other. If there's one wild fly here and one wild fly, you know, uh, 100 metres away, that's still left in the environment. You put 20 million flies in between them, they should never find each other. They should never mate and, and, and we break the breeding cycle. We've been using sterile flies in South Australia for decades and a really important tool. We used them as part of a, a metro response, a significant med fly response we had two years ago. And, and uh, we think that they are a really important part of particularly getting into some of those backyards where we might have trouble accessing with our traditional techniques. So that was um, a fair bit fairly quickly, but I just wanted to run through that fairly quickly so that um, I could leave time for any questions or, or any comments that people might have. Oh, am I on? Yep. Good on your neck, um, man. You've got your work cut out with some of those uh, areas of infestation. I'm going to ask the audience now. There's some microphones roaming. Yep, we've got a few questions. Here we go. Wilma, you're first up. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just wondering, do you have any public backlash around sterilising flies? No, we don't. And look, we do get public backlash against uh, amongst various things, and usually it's about accessing backyards. But sterile flies is something that people um, generally accept. It's, it's done um, off-site, and so we sterilise these flies using an X-ray machine. Uh, I think it's 30 grey dose, which is quite a low dose. It's done in, in the factory, and the, the pupae come out in a sterilised way. So there's no irradiation that's being, um, I guess, applied in the field, and maybe that's helping the public acceptance. Um, but it's not something that we've had to manage. One thing we are managing is the use of irradiation as a market access tool, where we, you know, irradiate fruit, and that's another matter altogether. And there is there is some public debate over that. But the flies themselves, no, we haven't had a lot of. It's it's really a, a good talking point generally, and fairly well accepted. Yeah, good stuff, Leanne. Uh, hi, Nick. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, my question for you is, um, if everything went as well as it possibly could for you in the response, how long do you think it would take for you to regain area freedom? Really good question. So we are uh, no illusions that this isn't going to be over quickly. I think our release day models, which we've normally used to resolve a, a really simple outbreak, suggest that we could um, be successful as early as the end of the year. That's not going to happen. Um, we think that we need to have a significant program of um, proof of freedom after the last fly is found, and we're not there yet. Our goal is to um, get to a stage by the end of the year where we're not having any more detections, and then likely, um, and it will be driven by markets, but likely have a 12-month period of proof of freedom to give assurance that what we've done has worked. So I, I think we're likely, um, let's say, 18 months away from reinstatement. It's a long game. One more question just here. Thank you, Nick. This is a very minor question. Um, the sterilised flies obviously seems like a great way of uh, interrupting their breeding, but I presume those sterilised flies, while they're alive, are still uh, doing some damage to the fruit, so I imagine it's not totally cost-free? Really good question as, as well. So with Medfly, we use a male-only strain, and so they don't sting fruit and we don't see any impacts on the fruit. With the Q-fly, we've got a bisex strain, so there are females out there. Um, but funnily enough, and I, I, I'm not sure why it's the case, we don't see fruit impacts from these sterile flies. Um, our entomologists will tell us that um, they are um, not driven to sting as much because of their sterility, so I, I, I don't know whether that's the case. But no, we, we did have a bit of um, a challenge introducing sterile flies for the first time into these production areas, but people were concerned about that. And so we had to do it in a graduated way, but no, we're not we're not seeing those those impacts in the orchard, which is great. Any further questions, Nick? Yep, one up here. Stuart, if you can turn around and look at the uh, camera. Yeah, um, Nick, with all of that trapping going on, have you moved into remote trapping technology at all? Great question. We have looked at that. We've trialled what's. Uh, uh, it's called a rapid aim trap, which you might have heard about, remote trapping. Really exciting technology, and we know it's about as effective as our traditional traps. 
the two things that have prevented us use, or three things have prevented us using it. It's not yet recognised as part of our national protocol. So even though we think they're effective, they're not actually recognised in the trade protocol. The second one is that um, we have two traps at each site, so there's not really a cost saving with using them because we have to go to the site for checking for Medfly anyway. The big one, though, is um, those rapid aim traps and the smart traps aren't able to distinguish a sterile fly from a wild fly, and we need to collect the sample, take it in, look for dye, sometimes do an isotope test. So we would be registering thousands of hits per week if we were only using the smart traps, so there's not really that efficiency gain for us yet. Um, they may one day be able to tell the difference, and that's that's the day we're waiting for, I guess. Fantastic. One couple more questions. Um, thanks, Nick. Really good talk. Um, two questions. One, who's paying for the response? And secondly, do you have established a stop-go um, gate where you get to a point and all the parties that are funding have agreed that uh, eradication isn't uh, possible or won't be continued? Good question. Thank you. Um, so the first one first is that um, funding the, the response itself is, is, is fully funded by the state government. But I want to make it clear that there's there's costs and and things that are being funded outside of the response, which which industry are, are are funding, and it's a really significant cost, and that's largely around the market access treatments, the administrative requirements, but also the in orchard treatments, and we've got some, um, and it does vary per business how much that costs, but it's in the tens of thousands of dollars that each business is contributing to the control, but also the market access arrangements. Stop go wise, we, we do have a, a national emergency response deed, which would normally have key triggers in it, which would bring the parties together to say, um, uh, we, do we still think it's technically feasible to eradicate and cost beneficial? This doesn't sit under that deed, but we've mirrored those arrangements with our industry parties where every month we have a, an agreed set of triggers and say, look, um, if X, Y or Z are happening, that means what we're doing isn't having the impact we want. We either have to modify our strategy or relook at um, what we're aiming to do. So we do that every month. We haven't hit that point where we say, look, we need to change our approach at all. We've, we've had to nudge our approach, but not, not change it. And that's that's done with industry. We sit down together and it looks and, and, and look at, uh, I think there's about nine or 10 triggers we look at each month. Fantastic. Look, I think we're gonna have to, we got one more? Have nope. we got time? Not. Nope. We got time? Yeah, go on. Oh, I go, go on. Oh, well, I started now. Um, <laughs> my question was originally along Barry's lines, but I have um, another one, and it's about um, collaboration across states. I understand Australia, um, you know, you're all quite um, individualised in your state um, and how you manage things, but fruit fly is a, a multi-state problem, and B, some have it and some don't. So I was just interested um, how nationally you collaborate on some of these or whether it's a really state-by-state response? It's another, I've said it every time, but that's another really good question. So you're right, we do have to collaborate and, and there are some different positions on fruit fly depending on what fruit fly you do or don't have. We have a national fruit fly council um, where all of the states and industry come together to try to s sort of sort through that complexity. Um, and I've got to say there's um, collegial approach to managing fruit fly, but also understanding that perhaps in the eastern states, it's all about um, in orchard management and reducing impact, whereas South Australia, Tasmania, and in the case of Q fly, Western Australia, it's about exclusion and eradication. So yeah, it can cause some strong debate at times, particularly when we're talking about domestic market access and what we have to treat our fruit with to access states, but we, we have that open forum where we, we, we talk about it and, and, and try to find solutions, even if they're not always um, mutual um, and, and, and the same across each state. Really important forum, that one, though, because it also includes for, um, industry in the room as well, where we, we try to find those national positions. Hey, Nick, that's been an awesome. Um, I want the crowd here to put their hands together for Nick. What a great uh, presentation. You've got your work cut out over there, but you're um, very focused and you've got a plan, and uh, we uh, really enjoyed hearing about uh, fruit fly in South Australia. Thanks very much. No problems. If I, if, I, if I can just say, look, we are very similar, I think, in our view, and so any opportunity to collaborate, I really appreciate catching up with Matt and team. Um, we've done that a couple of times now, so more than happy to keep doing that. I think we've got some, some common ground. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right.